When your characters become people, you have to allow you have to allow that they do what people do. And two things that people do that we always we never count on: people surprise and people disappoint. Mm -hmm. And uh, when, and to start to live with that, because um, Lilith surprised me several times, she disappointed me a profound number of times, and just sort of you almost like become this kind of journalist for imagined people, in a way. At least that's how that's that's how I got through writing characters like right. that. To the Harbour Grace excursion with the most to have. Books really saved my life. Our conversation tonight, uh, our guests need no real introduction, so I will give them a very quick one. Uh, Marlon James is the 2015 Man Booker Prize winner, first Jamaican to do so, uh, for, his, <laughs> for his third novel, A Brief History of Seven Killings. And David Chariandi is the most recent winner of the Rogers Writers Trust Fiction Prize for his wonderful novel, Brother. Uh, We have quite a lot of ground to cover, so I think we're just going get, to get down to it. Well, gentlemen, thank you both for coming to do this. Um, I thought I would just frame what I hope we can touch on tonight with a very quick anecdote about a little-known journey that took place in Irish literary history. In 1931, Patrick Kavanagh, who was a working farmer, uh, decided to visit George Russell, who was an editor, who had published one of his poems and said some encouraging things. And he'd paid him a full guinea in 1929, the year yeah. of the crash. So he'd rewarded him. And he decided that he wanted to meet Russell and change his style to evolve a little. Uh, he could have gone on a bike or a train, but he decided to walk. So he walked 55 miles in 1931, in midwinter. And he arrived at Russell's house in Dublin. Russell's wife was terminally ill at the time. It wasn't a great time, but he put aside a day and a half and he sat with Patrick Kavanagh. He discussed literature and he sent him home with 60 pounds of books. Mm -hmm. It turned out this is an enormously useful investment in Irish literature because Kavanagh was a social butterfly and he met everybody and he influenced everyone. Mm -hmm. And that conversation, that, that, that two-day journey paid dividends for decades, most noticeably in the work of Seamus Heaney, who said that when he read The New Kavanagh, he realized for the first time that a life like his and language like his could be used to make art. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I thought that the conversation tonight would be very interesting to hear who was your Russell? Who made you want to make that journey? Mm -hmm. How did you make that journey? And what did you bring back? Hmm. Man, who is my Russell? So, well, I was going to go with David first oh, to give good. you a little time. Because I've been thinking about it. Because it's going to take me a while to think about that. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, when, you, when you won the, the, the Writers um, Trust Prize, you named Austin Clark very directly. Yes, and so I guess um, that name certainly comes to mind. Um, another author who, whose work I find profoundly daunting and inspiring and whose words um, have moved me and I, I just, I, in a sense, the, the world of words that this author has created is a world that I see no way out of in a certain way. I mean, mm -hmm. that, that is, you know, it's, it's not my world, but it's, it marks almost the horizon of what, of, of what I see and do, and that's, that's Dion Brand. And so, but both of those authors, I guess, coming from uh, the Caribbean, both of them born in the Caribbean and then coming to Canada mm -hmm. and producing uh, bodies of literature that speak to life for back, black people in Canada, speak to life in the Caribbean, and then all of the places in between. Mm -hmm. um, I, guess, I guess they would be 
they would be uh, the figure of, of which you've just, um, you've just spoken, I guess. In, in an interview with the Globe and Mail, you said that you were an avid reader as a child, and in Austin Clark was the first time you realized that people like you could be in, in books, because yes. he wrote about working class people from the Caribbean. Yeah, yeah, so he wrote uh, his, first, uh, uh, his first book set uh, in Canada was The Meeting Point. It was part of the Toronto Trilogy. And in it, he wrote, uh, among other things, of uh, black domestic workers from the Caribbean. And that was how my mother came to right. Canada. And, and so um, I oftentimes wonder if uh, you know, that generation before, if we're talking about legacy, and, mm -hmm. and that's, that's you know, legacies of Caribbean writing and legacies of language, um, I oftentimes wonder if uh, my mother didn't really want to talk too much about her experience coming to Canada in those early days, which were no doubt difficult and, and alienating in many different ways. And so I found those lives represented in the works of Austin Clark, and it was strange to, mm -hmm. to see it, you know, and to know that, yeah, to know exactly that, that that could be a topic of literature, um, something that was so close to home. And so, um, yeah, that was certainly one of the, one of the ways that, the things that sparked my, sparked my attention, yeah. What about you, Marlon? Um, in terms of a Kavanaugh, I was a John Hearn, um, in, the sense that, in the sense that John Hearn was my creative writing teacher. Right. And, uh, you know, and I, I remember because my absolute best short story was followed by my absolute worst short story. And the same passion which he praised me the week before, he tore me a new one <laughs> the, the, the week after. Because, it, 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 you know, he, I remember one, I still remember, he's like, you know, you know, Marlon, accounting for all acrobatics, I don't think two people cannot fall from six feet and still continue having sex. <laughs> <laughs> it was, a, it was, a, it was brutal. Hearn did not, Hearn did not play. Um, <laughs> uh, so, it, but, but it's, the, the I never even thought of the whole idea of a literary life mm -hmm. until stepping into, into John's office. And, and um, talking about books in a way that wasn't necessarily in a literature class, like talking about living writers and talking about how to make prose. Um, you know, but for, for me, it's, it's also quite a few people. Um, the person mm -hmm. who sent me to read the tons of books would have been Elizabeth Nunes. Okay. Um, Elizabeth Nunes, um, I was at uh, the Calabash Festival, they, were, they used to have a writer's workshop, and uh, I um, presented my first novel, which became John Crow's Devil, and Elizabeth said, you know, you're a pretty good writer, but you don't have a clue about women. <laughs> and uh, I said, what are you talking about? I have a mother. <laughs> 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 And then she asked me the question, which usually leaves male writers dumbstruck. Which women have you read? Not the dead ones. Mm -hmm. And I, there was only one, and Jessica Hagen, I'm going to get to her, but there really wasn't anybody. Mm -hmm. So the clutch of books she sent me back with was like Toni Morrison, Sula and Song of Solomon, um, Toni Cade Bambara, Alice Walker, Iris Murdoch, mm. Muriel Spark, wow. um, and, and Book of Night Woman could never have happened without me reading Toni Morrison. Mm -hmm. uh, just, it just couldn't. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, I, just, I just didn't know literature could be like that. I had no idea. I read, I read Song of Solomon. I was on a balcony when I got to the end of that. Do not read that book when you're on a balcony. <laughs> <laughs> because I was swear to God I was going to jump off. Not because I was going to, like, kill myself. I was convinced I was going to fly uh -huh. <laughs> because of that book. Um, so, yeah, um, so it's kind of like that. And if I think about somebody who had that profound effect, but I never met them and all I had was their work, because if you're in the Caribbean, you rarely have a Kavanaugh. You know, a mm -hmm. lot of times Kavanaugh is just somebody whose work you fall in love with, mm -hmm. and that work spurs, spurs you on. And... Um, 
Funny enough for me, that was not a Caribbean writer. It was a, a Filipino writer named Jessica Hagidorn, who I just mentioned. Um, I read her novel, Dog Eaters, and I said, you know, this is the best novel ever written about Jamaica, but it's set in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the best novel ever written about Venezuela, but it's set in the Philippines. Yes. It's, like, it's the best novel about New Orleans, but it's set in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. And if you're from places like Kingston or Port of Spain mm -hmm. or Manila or Cape Town, you know, you know the situation where you're always in the middle of an election or a beauty contest. <laughs> <laughs> so when I read that book, I'm like, I had no, the same thing, it's the recognition of self. It's a book set in Manila, and it's the yeah. first time I recognized myself and my country in a book. Mm -hmm. And I had no idea you could do that. I had no idea the world you could see outside is a world you could write about. And by doing that, by her doing that, it made me see, that book made me see Jamaica in ways that no book about Jamaica did. Right. Yeah. But isn't that, I mean, something very, many things very profound about what you mm. said, but something uh, that strikes me um, is the fact that you can recognize in intimate terms the Caribbean or the mm -hmm. place you call home or the place that is your past, but it's not actually about the mm -hmm. Caribbean. So that, that very act of recognizing mm -hmm. one's home, uh, one's literature, one's self, but askance in a certain way. That's, yeah. that's really, yeah. yeah. The, the idea of how the West Indies has been represented <coughs> in mainstream fiction, a very problematic one. We were touching on this in the green room. Mm -hmm. because there was a Windrush generation in England. Right. And between 1960 and 1974, 80 West Indian novels were published in London, many of them through writers who were associated with the BBC show Caribbean Voices. And the, they are the usual suspects, so Lamming, Naipaul, Mittelholzer, Selvon, and Kamal Brathwaite, mm -hmm. beyond that, Wilson Harris. And these were largely upper middle class West Indians, mixed race, male, very intellectual. Mm -hmm. And they had a niche open to them within literary London, mm -hmm. one that they were kept out of, as it turned out in the end. Mm -hmm. But that is what West Indians would have grown up reading and knowing as their literature. Mm -hmm. So when you come along in your own ways from two sides of the mirror later, in Jamaica and in Toronto. Where do you see your way in that landscape? How did you find your way? I mean, we mentioned, we touched on this to some extent. Mm -hmm. You had yeah. writers who guided you. Well, I mean, the first thing that, that strikes me about that list is if that's the way in which the Caribbean itself recognizes its own literary heritage, it's in, in it's an exilic heritage, right? It is. So it's people mm -hmm. who have gone away, mm -hmm. um, found publishing opportunities, found the space to write, found mentors, and so forth, and then thereafter have represented the Caribbean. And that's, that's interesting. I mean, that's a whole topic for discussion. Absolutely. You know, if Caribbean literature is an exilic phenomenon, mm -hmm. then um, that's, that's uh, questions, you know, questions are, but then there's the Caribbean diaspora, and I, I imagine that's what I represent insofar mm -hmm. as I'm a, a part of that phenomenon. I've, I've never lived in the Caribbean. I've never lived in Trinidad, where my mm -hmm. parents come from. And so Trinidad, I would maintain, though, that Trinidad lives for me in a different way. It lives in music and tastes. It lives in language. Mm -hmm. It lives in stories spoken and unspoken that I've explored and mm -hmm. that I've then represented in my own work. Um, but to me, you know, you, there's the two things. It's that, that, that generation that went away to write. But for me, it's, it's a generation uh, like Austin Clark that is that first generation to then settle in a new land and perhaps stay there, mm -hmm. like Canada. And I am the next generation. Mm -hmm. So having not lived in that land of my parents' birth, to then nevertheless, so why? Why would I care about that other line? Why do I write about that mm -hmm. other line? Why does my imagination carry me there? And I guess it has a lot to do with how, you know, how I'm made to feel 
as a Canadian, mm -hmm. the reasons why I might, um, my, why I might uh, be interested in, in mm -hmm. origins, whereas maybe another second generation immigrant wouldn't be interested in those mm -hmm. questions. Um, but that's how I begin to position myself. But I can, I've got to say, it's so humbling being up on stage with uh, people like the two of you, <laughs> you know, who intimately through experience know mm -hmm. the Caribbean. Because mm -hmm. I don't, in that sense. I although I, 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 although I, I push back. I don't know. That's, no, so that's <laughs> yeah. the interesting thing. No, no, so there's a brilliant line. I want to, there's my chance to mention. There's a brilliant yeah. line in History of Seven Killings, the Rolling Stone reporter. Right. What's uh -huh. his name again? Pierce? Alex Pierce. Alex Pierce. Alex Pierce. And so he um, encounters uh, Nina Burgess, another, another character. Nina is mm. from Jamaica. Alex Pierce is a white uh, man from mm -hmm. America, Rolling Stone record, reporter. He talks to, uh, kind of talks in this conversation with Nina, they've just met. Um, Nina's kind of giving uh, him a hard time and he says, you know, don't give me a hard time. Uh, I'm not like those tourists. Uh, I know the real Jamaica, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And so then Nina has this chance to respond. You know, here's a white American telling me, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, Nina's thinking, I know the real Jamaica, I've lived my whole life here. Mm. And of course, the way you think it's gonna go is, Nina's gonna go, you don't know the real Jamaica, I know the real Jamaica. But she doesn't do that. Mm -hmm. She says, you know what, that's good for you. I've lived here all my life, and I don't know the real Jamaica. Right? <laughs> and so that is a brilliant, as a yeah. brilliant one of the, you know, it's such a, you know, every page. Well, like Nina is, is definitely like me in that sense, yeah. that we were just talking about it this mm -hmm. morning, about, um, and I, I'm going to get back to that question, about there are people in Jamaica who have never seen downtown. Mm -hmm. Right. And there are people in Jamaica in downtown who, if you say, can you take me to um, Stony Hill Hotel, they have no idea how to get there. Mm -hmm. And that, um, that a lot of um, enterprising men in Jamaica know the way to have an affair is to cut across class lines. Right. <laughs> because <laughs> two women of a separate class will never, ever meet, even if they live right. on the same street. You so, do know women. So I'm, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm giving it away for anybody in the audience. Some people are going to have a really hard time tonight. Um, but to come back to the, to the... So, you know, my first two novels are written in Jamaica. And um, so it's... And, and pretty much all of those books I've read. And uh, even, even when I first read them, I could tell even when they're writing about their countries, it was still from a point of kind of exile. Mm -hmm. And there was a kind yeah. of, a sort of nostalgia in them. Mm -hmm. Like, I love Miguel Street, but you can tell he wasn't there. Mm -hmm. Or he was, when, but he wasn't, he, I mean, mentally, who knows where Naipaul is. Um, <laughs> but it's, so it's, <laughs> and also growing up, my generation, the, 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 the big difference, I think, with those, those writers as well, is that their gaze was still the UK, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, whereas growing up in the, in the 70s, 80s, the overriding cultural force was America. And I think that's a big difference in terms of, of who is the, 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 the shadow lingering behind you mm -hmm. or, or, or the place where even in terms of it never even occurred to me actually to go to a British publisher. Right. To, to, and then when I did, it ended up with a really ridiculous thing where they asked me to write over Night Woman as a, some sort of Jane Austen novel right. with black people. Mm -hmm. um, which again ties into a, a sort of idea of what a Caribbean novel should be, mm -hmm. which I just don't have, it just doesn't register with me at all. Mm -hmm. Well, you've, you're sort of preempting my question. My mm. next, um, because, I've doing that. <laughs> no, because. Um, <laughs> Oddly enough, as you just touched on the, the Naipaul thing, the, mm -hmm. the very first novel that you published, The Mystic Masseur, it has this prefatory note. All characters, organizations, and incidents in this novel are fictitious. This is a necessary assurance because although its politicians have taken to calling it a country, Trinidad is a small island no bigger than Lancashire with a population somewhat smaller than Nottingham's. And on it goes. And this idea of translating the Caribbean. Be a I know, so it's that. astonishing. <laughs> really, Night Paul? Anyway. Well, <laughs> I agree. And I'm a, and I'm a huge Completely fan of his work, but anyway. But you could no. see that there's the effort to nice. translate us into mm -hmm. acceptable literary form. 
Mm -hmm. And it strikes me very much as, like you said, that's an exilic move, that's a, a modernist move, a very abstract thing. Mm -hmm. And you seem to be working very much the other way, to embody yeah, us, but I think both it's not, of you. Yeah, but it's not just us. I think Edwidge Danticat does it, I think Juna yeah, Diaz do correct, it, yeah. and we all get flack for it. Because I think there is this sort of old idea that no matter what, defend the country. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No matter what, right. make it idyllic. Right. No matter what, right. um, so it, and and which is not to say that some of these works aren't great, mm -hmm. but in terms of like the the, the violence that happens in an Edwidge Danticat or a Roxane Gay novel, wouldn't have been written then, and she, they still get flack for it. Edwidge mm -hmm. still gets a lot of flack. Why? Why is every Haitian man a rapist? Because every Haitian man is not a rapist, mm -hmm. and not every Haitian man is with Tonton Macoud. But it's something that we, I certainly get it, and I still get it. This sort of um, you're, you're showing unflattering views of the country. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, and, and that's a two-pronged statement. It's one, you're showing our underbelly, and two, the older generation wouldn't have written like that. Uh, because I think also a lot of the older writing, not the good, a lot, and a lot of the, the not good older writing was, was trying to impress mother country. Uh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, oh God, I now I just I just lost what I was gonna say. <laughs> okay, well, well, let me pick. No, up with, okay, no, okay. so 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 mm. no, you mentioned nostalgia, right? Right. And so um, I, I did want to say this: two things. So you they mentioned the the place of both the UK and then of America with respect to the Caribbean uh -huh. and the kind of the these two powers and two sites from which writing about the Caribbean could be produced. Okay. And I just want to mark that Canada then is that third, it's the third power. The third It leg. really is, mm -hmm. it really is. It really because, is. Because mm -hmm. Toronto especially is a major, is a major hub. And so it has its own, now the character of that writing is, is up for grabs, I think. I don't even know if there is, mm. uh, but it, you know, if you're asking that question about where I see myself, I. I do that's 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 a particular kind of tradition of of Caribbean writing that mm -hmm. has been produced in Canada, incubated in Canada. To add to that, this is a question for you. Do you think then that's one of the reasons why a writer who is very much their peer, Austin Clark, still managed to have a very Caribbean sense? Is it being would he would he have had that where he and I mean, what am I saying? Would he have had that had he lived in the UK? Had he been looking dealing mm, with the British yeah, gaze? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, no, I think you're I think that's a great point. Yeah. I think I think maybe in Canada there were there was colonialism and then colonial inferiority at the mm -hmm. same time. Mm -hmm. And then 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 Austin Clark kind of emerging as a person extraordin you know, extraordinarily dignified, um, you know conservative member of the Anglican Church, writing mm -hmm. kind of different stuff, completely different mm -hmm. stuff, stuff that's really, uh, you know, mm -hmm. um, highly critical of all these yeah. institutions and, yeah. and mores and whatnot. Yeah. But yeah, I, I, think, I think he would. No, I don't think, I, so I don't think Austin Clark would have been Austin Clark if he, if he had went to America or the UK. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. Yeah. Yeah. Now, just to, to move it just a, a tiny bit on, because C.L.R. James is, to my mind, the great exception to this rule because he was very much from that world and he was a world-class world intellectual. But then he wrote what, what may well be the greatest book to date, published out of the Caribbean, The Black Jacobins. Mm -hmm. And he said that he was motivated to write that because he was fed up with reading of reading stuff happening to black people. And he wanted to, to, re, to write a book in which black people happen to the world. Mm -hmm. And I remember that moment of reading that book and the thrill it gave for everyone in my generation. Mm -hmm. But it's still in, involved in that slightly defensive, nationalistic, protective image of the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. And it strikes me that you, Marlon, and mm -hmm. to, in a different way, David, are breaking that mold. Because like you said, when you wrote the Book of Night Women, people were appalled because mm -hmm. your characters chat bad. Mm -hmm. They use a lot of vulgarity. They're not ennobled by their suffering. And so right. could, could you talk mm -hmm. through what you had in mind when you were setting out on that? Um, well, one thing I certainly didn't have in mind was writing that book. Um, because I was very much sold on all the things you were talking about. Right. Um, and the very first attempts at writing Night Woman was that kind of 
of novel. You know, this sort of, first of all, do no harm uh -huh. kind of thing. <laughs> and, um, and when, when um, Lilith, the character, appears, and she really doesn't appear till like page 45 in the original version of this book, mm -hmm. and hijacked it. And, and it, it, that book was a fight to the end with me like it's my book damn it mm -hmm. yeah. it's not your book because it's but then it, a lot of things about Lilith became very important to me one being that she is not as I said not noble savage and not so she I mean Lilith does some despicable things mm -hmm. and I think that is one of the things that people had a problem with that it's it's where is the noble suffering that we want from the Caribbean novel mm -hmm. Mm. And these are the Caribbean people asking that. Did you feel yeah. liberated though? Because, I mean, they they all cuss all the way through, mm -hmm. and I was very. Um, it's, so there, there. I remember the the Calabash where I read that book, and I read it on a stage. It was the first. I think it was the first time there was a protest at Calabash. Is that right? Yeah, people jumped up and started chanting, "There are children here. There are children here." <laughs> And then another group got up chanting, it's an adult reading, it's an adult <laughs> reading. I like, what did I just get myself into? Um, yeah, there was something, it's funny saying it was liberating writing that book because that book was not liberating when I wrote it. It didn't feel that way. It felt like a real fight. Mm -hmm. And it was a really intense and hard book to write. It was a difficult book to write. And... Um, you know, I loved her and hated her, and I miss her every day. But I, it's it's mm -hmm. it was a it it was um I don't think I was setting out to try to do something with with Jamaican letters because who really does that? No, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but at the same time, I knew I wanted to say something that I haven't read before. Right. Um, and I really believe Tony Morrison said, "Write the books you want to read." Right. Mm. And I wanted to read that. I wanted to, one. I wanted to read a book about Caribbean slavery. Because I think other than, I mean, there were very few. Mm -hmm. um, but I also wanted the kind of messy, ambiguous, not easy to conclude novels that I like, like a Toni Morrison novel or an Iris Murdoch novel or a Richard Powers novel. You know, these really complicated novels that leave you with complicated feelings. Mm -hmm. um, my absolute favorite response to that one was some woman created a forum online where they're commenting as they're reading chapters. It was the greatest thing. it would be like, I can't believe what she done do now. And I'm like, I was like, later girlfriend, I can't stand her this week, so I'm gonna put down this book. And, like, <laughs> and that's exactly the kind of response. Mm -hmm. I, wanted, I wanted the kind of, the way we inhabit these novels that I read and like and have very complicated feelings about. Mm -hmm. And that's what, that was really what I wanted. Well, I, I also noticed that originally in your draft had them in 1831 for the Christmas Rebellion, and right. you moved them back mm -hmm. 30 years, you let Lilith take over. Right. A lot of writers say that they follow the characters, but you actually do. I mean, to the point where you will rewrite huge yeah. drafts. And well, honestly, it's more she dragged me along than I followed her. Okay. <laughs> Um, because as I say, I, it's, it's, um, I go back at my old emails, I did it from MFA, and you should read the emails I'm giving to my professor. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, she's going to that other estate. I said, well, she's going to this. It's like, no, it's my book, damn it. I don't like that estate. <laughs> and so I know she dragged me kicking and screaming through that whole novel. But that was also a lesson that helped me with, with, um, with brief history, that you, when your characters become people, you have to allow you have to allow that they do what people do, and two things that people do that we always we never count on people surprise and people disappoint mm -hmm. and uh, when, and to start to live with that because um, Lilith surprised me several times, she disappointed me a profound number of times, and just sort of you almost like become this kind of journalist for imagined people in a way. And that's how, that's, that's how I got through writing characters like right. that. Well, with David, it, you, you seem to me to be working a much narrower range of voices, beautifully, I, may, I, I must say. Uh, Donna Bailey Nurse described it as uh, a Rubik's Cube. She said, if you look at Sukuyan and you look at brother, you can see their common elements, an absent father, an older brother, a mother that's coming apart mentally in, in various ways. Um, 
how do you work through those? Uh, well, I, I can't help but kind of be mesmerized by listening to, to Marlon talk about his process and also be mesmerized reading his work because um, it is a kind of completely different canvas. It's so polyvocal. There's so many different mm -hmm. characters. It is so maximalist. It is so huge. Uh, and that's the, you know, the, the last two novels are really so huge. And, um, and so coming here, I was wondering, you know, um, I'm almost the opposite. My novels, I would say that I'm a type of a minimalist mm -hmm. in a way. Miniaturist. Uh, miniaturist, miniaturist. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a difference? <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. No, no, I, I like <laughs> miniaturist. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and... Uh, I guess the problem there is that maybe I, I feel, like it's just myself, I feel I have no lesser room for myself <coughs> for forgiveness and lesser margin of, uh, of an, uh, for error, I guess. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I will obsess over... It's interesting, I, I don't typically think in terms of character mm -hmm. when writing, the characters appear. But I think that's a magical moment, again, another moment when you're mm -hmm. mesmerized by your writing process. But I, don't th I think in terms of the line, and then the character somehow finds itself within the line. But that line can be written over and over so many times. And I have to fail at that line. I, I, mm -hmm. um, you know, if, if I write that line 10 times, and I write it correctly, miraculously, the first time, I have to fail nine mm -hmm. other times before I can come back and say, yes, I, I did actually get it the first time. Yeah. It's funny, I wouldn't have thought that reading your work. Really? No, no because, because uh, so much of your work, it's, uh, it, particularly Brother, it's so important at inhabiting character. And yeah. I remember reading it and thinking, to an extent, Brother is an elegy. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, and you, can't, you can't do that without intimacy. You can't do that with really inhabiting. So I, I, it, it struck me as, you know, it's, it's this sort of almost sitting down in space and just waiting on this person to tell you what the story right. is. Right. Just say so that's yeah. what you were thinking all along. Yes. No, I, like, I, like the way, yeah. I like the way you're putting it. <laughs> How can I not? <laughs> can you write that on the back of my book? <laughs> Wait, you've already uh, done this. <laughs> so, yeah. Because to come to what we're, we're, we're asking, this is, not, this is not a kiss ass fest. Yeah, um, I know. I know. But, I'm going to get it from my friends after. <laughs> but I also think, though, that one of the things that, that we. we, we we're still seen as, as that maybe new or newer in, 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 in the Caribbean novel, and by that I mean the Caribbean and diaspora, is a sort of keenly observed mm -hmm. sort of, of, of novel. You know, the kind of novel that we would expect from, say, Nick, Nicholson Baker, like a mezzanine mm -hmm. or, or mm -hmm. so on. And I think that also is, is, is a pretty radical yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. 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 Well, I wanted to drill right down now into language because mm -hmm. it seemed to me. I'll go you first, David. The, in Sukoyan, the mother has a moment where she is comparing the back of a head that has re recently been operated on and the stitching. Oh, right. It looks like a... Sh uh, and she uses the word washikong, which I hadn't heard for 30 years. <laughs> I didn't even know Trinidadians used it. Right. So, <laughs> and I know that you have in your acknowledgement um, Lise Weiner's yeah. amazing uh, dictionary produced in Canada, to mm -hmm. your point, yeah. of, of Trinidadian English, mm -hmm. which shows this vast range of things. And you use strategically bits of Trinidadian English to give a resonance to the descriptions. But then, at a certain stage, you, you run into, for example, a dougla, which is what you are. Yeah, yeah. A dougla is the Trinidadian slang for mixed race. But in Hindi, it's, it's a bastard. Mm -hmm. It's premised on the idea that mixed people would be an accident. Mm -hmm. right. And uh, yeah, I mean, you, you run into this all the time, mm -hmm. the, the range of, of language you use. So how do you approach a language that is obviously yours, but at the same time, slightly at one remove? Yeah, it is definitely at one remove. And you know, that's what you know, I think I could put it this way, that's what the Caribbean is for me. It's not a physical place it, in, insofar as I've lived in it. I know it exists, you know, I've been there. Um, but it's, it's really, it is language, it is story and words that have come to, to me. And many of those words, for much of my life, I did not understand. 
Uh -huh. So when my mother tells me or told me a story about a sukunya, I, it's like, what on earth is that? <laughs> you know, and she would just tell the story as a great, oftentimes great storytellers do. They just tell the story and they're not going to provide parenthetical commentary and footnotes to, to you know, <laughs> for you, you may not understand what's going on. This story is its own magic. And it carried on that way in my head. And so, and so my, my novel, in, in, a, in a sense, became... Um, a type of archaeology upon language itself. So what, what does that word mean? Mm -hmm. And um, um, there's, a, there's a line in the book where a character says, my history is a foreign word. Mm -hmm. And um, in a certain way, that's, that's also a, a method for creative writing, right? Um, we have words that have been layered with all kinds of historically with all kinds of meanings and whatnot, and it's invisible to us if we're fluent in a language. But if you're like me, you're privy to a second language that's not your own, but that you hear in the home, that's your parents, that you don't quite understand. Mm -hmm. um, that itself becomes an extraordinary medium in which to kind of, to kind of find, a, find a story. But always to position, I mean, this is a thing, always to, I don't get in trouble for representing the Caribbean in this, in one way or the other. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily because I don't represent the Caribbean, I do, mm -hmm. but in, uh, not, not in, in as elaborate ways as Marlon does, obviously. Mm -hmm. But I don't get that because I'm always positioning myself as someone on the, intimately on the outside, trying to read that space. And so I'm encoding the very fact that I'm, I'm trying to understand that space too, not as a kind of external, dispassionate, objective observer, someone invested in something, someone who is summoned and called and, and, and uh, is connected to that place, but someone nevertheless from the outside. The exilic writer, however, might be read as authentically representing that place on the basis of lived experience and representability. And I, I'll never have that because I'm, I'm upfront about that, I think. I'm not sure I agree because I think your grasp of West Indian English is extraordinary because you are able to hear, for example, like gallivanting and ragamuffins right. and so on. Yeah. But also, there's this moment in Brother when you, well, not you, the, the, where the narrator comes across his mother's book and he doesn't understand what standard A is. Right. And there are these four words that um, daffodil, Rochester, empire, and preposterous. Legacy and to, of colonialism. That's well, that, 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 <laughs> all, all those words. <laughs> Daffodils, yeah, they don't grow there. <laughs> preposterous, mm. you know, uh, Rochester, these, yeah. It yeah. was like a little poem of, of yeah, the yeah. colonial history. Yeah, yeah it is. So, yeah, yeah. Um, we're running out of time, unfortunately. Now, mm. Marlon, mm. Um, on the question of, Engl of language, in addition to all the cuss words, I noticed that you, <laughs> when Lilith went to uh, the second estate, Coulibre, yeah. um, there was a slip because one of the girls had on boots that were stush, and mm -hmm. I burst out laughing. And yeah. I remember you t telling me that you'd had slips like that in the, f in the Book of Night Women. Mm -hmm. But that when you came to write seven, uh, Brief History, you actually had vocabulary for the 70s, vocabulary for the... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you talk it through a little bit of that? Uh, well, a lot of it is, is just my fascination with language itself. Um, when I was at U University of West Indies, I almost switched to linguistics because mm. um, I'm still, I'm very much interested in language and etymology and so on. But in, in, in Jamaica, the one thing I'd say, and it's almost as a counter to, not a counter, but what I'd say to what David said is that, well, you know, rest assured, there's no authentic language there either. Right. Right. Um, yeah. Because yeah. This one, that's why one of the running gags in a novel is people talking about who chat bad. Right, yeah. And, yeah. and yeah. the amount of people yeah. who think, I am fine, that person chat <laughs> yeah. bad. Right, right. I don't want to point out that the phrase chat bad is also a chat bad. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Um, but it's, it's, it's just because language is loaded. Language is, um, it's, 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 it's where people join together. It's also where people separate from each other, where people exclude each mm -hmm. other mm -hmm. in the novel. And um, I think it's one of the most powerful tools and social forces working in Jamaica, and I really wanted to capture that. Um, people who code switch with language, like Nina, like mm -hmm. me, yeah. um, 
you know, uh, but also there is like, there's a scene near the end when somebody, um, she's in the hospital and this woman realizes she's kind of an uptown girl and say, yeah, you have that, you have that uptown flatness. Yeah, yeah, you know, because yeah, yeah, uptown yeah, people talk yeah. like this, you know, yeah, and you know, I was, mm -hmm, I was yeah. going to go to Montego Bay, you know, ta. <laughs> you know, it's it's moment. It's like it's moment. <laughs> it's like <laughs> they go, you know, there's no future. It's future. <laughs> yes, no. uptown lady. But uh, <laughs> but <clears throat> yeah, it's it's. It, I I wanted to capture that that ultimately Patois is elusive. Mm -hmm. um, ultimately, there were so many different patois in that novel, and that was something I wanted to capture, that any form of language has range, and it, it mm -hmm. couldn't be commodified, even as the characters in the novel use it to sort of include and exclude. And a lot of it was just fun, you know, uh, making sure they don't sound in the 90s the way they sound in the 70s, and, and with the American um, language as well. Um, I think because, again, if I'm going to do a novel where I'm throwing it to the characters, then I have to get to that. So I, I had dictionaries for everybody. I had a 70s dictionary. I had a, well, I didn't need a Pato one, but I had mm -hmm. a whole bunch of, I shouldn't say I had, I had my students make it for extra credit. Oh, <laughs> oh it all comes out now. <laughs> because I, I, got, I have a book to write. I don't have time to write no damn dictionary. I was like, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so it became just this huge toolbox um, to sort of, um, uh, you know, play with. But a lot of that, it was, it was, that was, a, that was the battle for language was fought with Night Woman. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because it never occurred to me I was going to write a novel in Patois. Mm -hmm. And, and, it, and, 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 and uh, the me from, from 10 years ago would have been appalled at the idea. Mm -hmm. And I don't have a low opinion of Patois, except I do. You know, it's just sort of, um, it's good if you lose it for slapstick. It's good if you use it for humor. It's good if, you, if, if Pato knows its place. Mm -hmm. It's not good if you're trying to tell a complicated story where you're forced to feel a million different things. And writing that novel was also an education in, in that way for me. Um, it, and, and, oh, and that novel also served as an eventual disconnect with UK literary scene. Mm. Because it was a British publisher that wanted me to rewrite it. Whereas the American publisher was like, no, you're not doing a glossary because a glossary just points to that this is other. Yeah, oh, for sure. And I, don't, I never forgot those two exchanges. Because yeah. if I just mention that to mm -hmm. most people and say, which, who said what? They'll think it's the British person was fine with the patois. And the American was like, what is this? What's a saya? <laughs> it's kia. Kia, kia do it. Yeah, yeah, where it was the other way, <laughs> it was the other way around. Mm -hmm. Which, yeah. you know, still mystifies me in a way. Wow. Well, we're almost out of time, but I, I just wanted to sort of focus this very narrowly before we ended. Um, ultimately, we're not really talking about questions of literary taste. We're talking about the representations of black bodies, and we live in a time in which that's a very, very problematic issue. Mm -hmm. In David's forthcoming book, he talks about walking around in his good neighborhood. I haven't got time to read the full thing. In the Scarborough of my time, I hope you don't mind me using this, David. Sure. I, I don't know what it's from. In, in the, <laughs> the, 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 it's the forthcoming book, um, the oh. le letter to your... Oh, <laughs> oh okay. <laughs> um, in the Scarborough of my time, I was most often called a nigger or a jungle bunny or a spear chucker. Passing groups of boys on a sidewalk, walking wearily through a strip mall or down a suddenly narrowing school hallway, I knew I could be pushed or tripped that stuff could be thrown at me. Twice, very vividly, I felt the thin, wet splat of spit on my scalp. And when I turned, I saw a group of boys chuckling, though I was unable to tell which boy had been bold and bad enough to perform the act. A good chunk of my energy and attention as a child was devoted to monitoring the physical presence of people around me reading smiles for potentially wicked intentions, bracing when I heard about me laughter. As the parent of a mixed race child, that sent shivers down my spine, because that's not a Toronto that I recognize, but it seemed to me very much that you both in fully, Marlon on social media is fully engaged with this mm. issue. And I just, 
Last night I watched the Netflix documentary 13, and they covered the 100 years of the media representation of black bodies. Mm -hmm. And it struck me that both of you are working on a redefinition of that body and its meanings mm -hmm. in your own ways, the decriminalization of it. Mm -hmm. But what hope does literary fiction have when there's that weight of representation against it? It's a rather despairing question, but I thought mm -hmm. I'd ask it anyhow. Uh, well, um, I think one very modest contribution, if I have a contribution by telling that story, it's to uh, disabuse people of the idea that Canada is an exception. So, you know, the, the film that you mentioned is about uh, how that, that movement from slavery to, to Jim Crow to the American prison industrial complex all does the same thing, mm -hmm. you know? And, um, and I guess, you know, I guess I wanted to, it's a hard thing to tell, that's a, from a book that I'm writing, that I've written, that will be out soon. It's to my daughter, to my 13, uh, 14, now 14 year old daughter. And um, yeah, it's to, that's, that's a Canadian experience. That's in, uh, from, for some people, it's a very ordinary Canadian experience. You know, I didn't get called Dougla because they couldn't see. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, they, there wasn't a term for, for what I was. They, they simply saw a, a black mm -hmm. person. Um, they didn't use those kind words <laughs> all the time. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess, I guess that's, that's one kind of maybe important thing. You know, Canada had a, has a 200-year-old leg, year legacy of imagining itself distinct from America and, uh, you know, uh, and just uh, in, a, in a world of intolerance, um, a space of exception. Mm -hmm. And Canada does have historical specificity and historical differences and, and whatnot. And perhaps there are things that are possible in Canada and particular parts of Canada that are, are, that are not possible elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think we have to think about anti-black violence and oppression as continuities across spaces and throughout time. Mm -hmm. And that's um, telling stories that kind of draw attention to those continuities, drawing that link between here, Canada and the Caribbean, and drawing that link between now and the deep past of Marlon James' uh, second mm -hmm. novel. Those are crucial stories because they are providing, that's, that's what, that's what is the possibility of fiction regarding that specific? Mm. It's the connections, connections across space, connections mm. across time. Uh, what can literature do? I think literature is already doing it. You know, I think of um, Reginald Dwayne Betts, who's one of America's best poets. Um, Dwayne spent ten years in prison. Um, Dwayne went from prison to be prison to becoming a lawyer last year, being called to the bar last year. And um, of course, it happened because everybody from the New York Times down shamed the state of shamed the state to giving him his license. But the thing that's in between that prison stint and him becoming a lawyer is James Baldwin. Mm -hmm. At this very moment, there is somebody, even in even at the at the butt end of that whole equation, that's reading, you know, that's reading Sonny's Blues. Mm. Oh. That um, mm -hmm. literature, yeah. you know, Jeanette, Jeanette Whittison says, um, you know, reading is an act of free will and it's a private act. That's why everybody's so scared of it. Because you can get free and nobody knows you. You can tell I stole it for, for Night Woman, that line. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, I told her. She's fine with it. Um, that you, 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 yeah, that you can experience a profound shift in your very being in one afternoon and nobody knows but you. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 a lot of the revolutions that literature are doing, they're doing, it's doing quietly, mm -hmm. but it's doing it. And I think um, it's, 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 it's easy running into people who either don't think or have lost faith in what literature can do because I was like, well, maybe it lost faith with people who look like you or, or around you or your sort of an, an environment. But um, literature book stories, storytelling is still changing lives out there and there's still people out there 
who think of the, 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 the type of novels that wouldn't have happened 20 years ago. Tommy Orange has a novel coming out called There yeah, There. Yeah, I read uh -huh. it, it's amazing. And yeah, yeah. There There wouldn't yeah. have happened 20 years ago because you know we have Sherman and Alexi, do we need another Indian? Mm -hmm. right. The idea that there are multiple voices to be told. That's, you know, it's not even a matter of will literature be there so much as will stories be there and will voices be there. And both of those will still be there and they're still important. Um, and I think, um, I think we, 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 it's, it's what John Didion said, we tell stories in order to live. And I think it's a bigger question more of will we ever stop needing stories? And th the answer to that is no. Mm -hmm. um, if somebody has to tell truth to power, somebody has to, you know, the, the, as I said, the, the, the kid who does not get Patrick Kavanaugh in the flesh, mm -hmm. um, and if you're, you know, if you're, if you are, you know, if you are, if you are the, you know, the gay teenager in the most repressive part of America, you know, Edmund White is going to speak to you through a book with a fake cover so nobody comes to take it from you, and it's stuck somewhere under, under your bed spring somewhere. Mm -hmm. that, 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 that liberation, that so on, is happening. And I think literature has always done that, and it would always do that. And I know tons of people in this room can you know, even testify to that. So I, um, I, you know, I, 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 I never worry about literature. I never worry about what's going to happen. I remember um, I was at a panel. I'm um, like, so let me get this straight. So literature has survived wars, it survived famine, it survived extermination, it survived plagues, it survived book burnings, but you think irony is going to kill it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you think a bunch of, you think a bunch of, a, a bunch of baristas in Starbucks are going to kill it. Why don't you try? <laughs> you know. That's a perfect note, I think, to end on.